on, uh, on what you've heard so far. And obviously, some of you, many, many of you, in fact, probably the, everybody virtually, apart from those exhibitors who are here, ha has not yet seen Anthropocene Island. But I think you've been given quite a kind of um, very evocative uh, account of all the different novel methodologies being applied. I mean, my, my view is that the, this vision of creative alliances between biology, computation, and architecture is very much about drawing out potentials and processes uh, within the city, a city of resources, in an age of recovery, uh, well, as M Mitchell uh, described it, uh, would be age of recovery. A, an age of recuperation, where nothing is thrown away and we have intelligent, we, we occupy and uh, engage within intelligent life cycles. Um, and there's a transformed notion of, of urban resources and the agency of bioengineering. Now, at the same time, these mindsets and, uh, and, pro and, and systems and approaches challenge existing systems and models and many and they defy many of the logics that we live by both knowingly and uh, and perhaps even on our everyday an everyday basis we we overlook that we are living by someone else's logics that were based on systems that are now very anachronistic so i as a general question i mean maybe uh, to kick off, I asked Claudia, as the, cura the chief curator of this project, how you would respond to that. Um, can you repeat the question, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it seems to me that everybody together in this distributed, uh, distributed interactive, responsive uh -huh. urbanism, this uh, collegiate, very collegiate um, approach of teams and collaborators, what you've done is you're basically really questioning the way that we live in a planetary sense. What? And if we were tomorrow, or maybe the, the prototypical site of Palisari, some of the prototypical processes were to be more wide, widely applied across the world in cities, it would inevitably, as I think Bart's uh, description of what happened politically in Montenegro, it would definitely come into direct uh, confrontation with existing systems, existing logics of developers who want to exploit land, um, uh, companies who want to produce product products without us having a sort of a re reinventing their logics. Uh, yeah, as I was saying this morning, and I'll probably repeat a little bit with different words, and maybe mm. there are also different people in the public, is uh, the Biennale is about um, challenging certain cultural boundaries that exist, um, both uh, between uh, uh, research and practice and curation, then between uh, natural and artificial, or between science and, uh, and design and... Um, uh, I opened the day saying that, uh, uh, quoting myself, basically, the, the, the say that I write in the, ca the catalogue in which I say the Biennale is a space for um, speculation in between biology, computation and design, and this speculation um, it means that we want to try to, through the Biennale and so through a cultural event, to uh, produce um, a project that, that is also research and knowledge, and at the same time, we would like, I would like to try to put um, uh, the accent on, our, on design and aesthetic as a language um, in the capability to discuss politics uh, together with science, but in a different manner, so that problems are not solved, mm. but dealt with through interaction. So by daily interaction, we don't identify um, ecological problem or social problem is something that can be punctually resolved, but that can be systemically addressed. Yeah, and all of you teach, and uh, Marcus was describing the, you know, the challenging task of creating, a, a, a forging a new, new methodologies, tools, and, and per perceptions on the part of bio-integrated generation of designers who are focused on that. Um, it, is it the case that you are integrating the disciplines of science? And are you creating new science? Are you integrating existing sciences? 
Um, are you trying well, to create a, let's say, let's say, kind of renaissance generation? Really? No, surely, Which surely there's a bit of Many architects of would find uh, t too much, a bridge too mm -hmm. far for, for them personally. But on the other hand, there is, seems to be this huge appetite for this work as well. I, I think it's hugely fascinating and, and challenging in mm -hmm. terms of the, the educational platform which is asserted in the previous uh, talk that these fora of experimentation are really important because it's where people from different disciplines come together to try out things without knowing exactly what the results are. Now that's, on the one hand, extremely important, but it goes against a lot of the curricula-based education that we are used to. Mm -hmm. uh, so to create that level of experimentation, but also within the frame of rigor, is really important. And the difficulty we found again, as an interesting positive challenge, is that open experimentation with very unpredictable results and rigorous science needs a while to get together. I think there is more and more of an appetite from both sides to collaborate and find out actually the, the really positive uh, aspects of both sides, but it's not an, a given, it's not an immediate thing. And just to give an example, um, lots of work that we do we obviously we develop the concepts, we visualize them, we even do prototypes. In the moment we get with scientists together and the, science, the scientists have to test the materials or the growth patterns, the timescape changes dramatically. We move into several years of testing before we even get to somewhere where we can make sure this can actually happen. It mm. uh, means that the speed in which we develop our concepts and our ideas uh, has a different timeline. Um, but again, I think there is currently an ama amazing appetite, but there's a big question of how much do you give as a basic sort of knowledge or how much input do you give people who are studying in this interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary field that is very much between these different groups from the design into the engineering, into the biology and so on. Mm -hmm. it, I think there will be many options and there will be different schools and that's what is quite exciting about it, means that the results will be quite unpredictable. Mm -hmm. There's no fixed recipe for that. Mm -hmm. I can see Mitchell here on the screen. Um, can you hear us, Mitchell? Maybe yeah. the American, your uh, local Brooklyn perspective, uh, you, you would not be able to do what you do without having multidisciplinary teams. Do you, but you're at the same time, you're uh, very bold in, in going through them, engaging in the multi-scalar. I mean, the landscape architect yeah. was once regarded by the architect as someone who provided the sort of prettification of building, very, you know, buildings after the event. They weren't seen as these more political figures, and similarly, urban designers had their kind of um, messianic codes under modernism, but everything has changed in this new paradigm. I totally agree with uh, Marcos and his thoughts about the length of time it takes to go from experimentation that's in the design world to uh, experimentation in sciences. Even though the word is the same, the, the meaning is drastically different, especially when it comes to the epistemology. Uh, the base understanding in science is uh, epistemological canon. Scientists work on the shoulders of others and make incremental changes by doing replicatable experiments that others are meant to learn and repeat elsewhere again and again, and then improve upon or disprove one specific aspect. Yeah, design studio, which is the culture we're all familiar with, is uh, not set up to be that way. Even even design studio that's teaching you to be an architect, you can't uh, train a bunch of students to rethink Frank Gehry's Bill Bow or actually rebuild Frank Gehry's Bill Bow exactly the way they did it, learning all of the construction techniques and material techniques and parametric modeling, which actually wasn't used there, and then present it in a studio with one little incremental change. They would be laughed uh, out of the building in their fatigue. Uh, however, that is, that is epistemological canon. That is learning from things that have been achieved before that have taken 10 years or more to get to that point. So 
the schooling thing, which all of us are teaching, uh, is is very important to us to to have the kind of uh, the, the 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 ability to tease out and invent and innovate. But there's probably needs to be now, and certainly with conferences like this, I recognize it directly. Tracks of, of students that are uh, doctoral students that are meant to be in school seven years post uh, another professional degree, and they're working on making original contributions to the field of architecture by uh, working in teams in laboratories that do make those improvements. And they certainly could have all kinds of experimentation in that range of it. I think we do need more of this happening. And then we can have other students that just concentrate in building science and they go out and they become you know, people that design buildings. I don't want to take up too much of the time because I'm giant on the screen, so I, I'll, I'll just I'll make it short. Exchange of information that happened, uh, let's say, through this uh, 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 diagrammatic platform that we shared, uh, but at the same time. Uh, also was embodied in these different artifacts and, 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 and machines, which obviously makes it a lot easier to, to, to communicate exchange because all of a sudden you, you have something that you can touch and that you can uh, you know, debate upon and yeah. then discuss upon. I think that's where, the, for me, the, the kind of prototypical dimension becomes, uh, becomes interesting. It's not necessarily uh, you know, straight away to, to propose a solution or, or, or you know, a, a new technology as such but really is a, is, a, is a sort of medium for, for development uh, of new solutions, which sure. often end up re-describing the problem in the mm -hmm. first place. Yeah, we want to hear from the audience, but I want to quickly get in my, uh, the question that I proposed earlier on, my proposition. I think that it would be really great if every single city, um, where practical, m many cities, had a prototypical area. I mean, traditionally, there were these prototypical districts. Sweden had them. Um, we, ha we had one in the 50s during the Festival of Britain, where it's a new district of new housing to demonstrate yeah. the future. We could do the same I mean, in a sort of yeah. Alassari type yeah. manner. I mean, uh, I think what, what, what uh, Mitch has just described in, you know, about the, their project is an extraordinary example of that. Uh, and, clearly you know, engaged in, in that. In, that in, in our of, case, uh, yeah. I think we, we tried to, 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 to borrow a bit that idea and, and, and kind of embody that in the Biennale. So the Biennale itself is not just a kind of showcase of nice work, but uh, yeah. essentially also embodies a, a possible developmental model. Uh, so it's a kind of really a lab model, but it's a lab model that uh, it is not confined to, to, to academia or, or research as such, but really mm -hmm. you know, enters the community in different mm -hmm. ways. And certainly I think Pagliasare would be a, a perfect test bed of that, but uh, you know, there is, uh, I guess, plenty of, of, of places uh, here in, in Tallinn that could mm -hmm. host that, given, given the large amount of, of, of area that has been yeah. uh, converted and, and you know, effectively after the, yeah. the, 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 all the sort of uh, mm -hmm. Soviet uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. buildings and areas Areas, especially around the coast, uh, you know, have been abandoned. Uh, of course, uh, that, they offer opportunities. There that is um, something that I want to add with the, on the prototypical, because sometimes it's a term that can be un misunderstood, and especially I understood this by talking with journalists. Uh, often they understood the prototypical as something that comes before reality. So it's, it's a prototype of something. So when are you going to do the real one? <laughs> so uh, we don't intend prototypical in this. Manner. Uh, for me, prototypical is intended in the way um, Delanda described it in the book, um, um, Intensive Science and uh, Virtual Philosophy, uh, in which he talks about, uh, um, say, the, typology, the typologist thinker see the abstract type as the reality and the exception as the exception from the diversion from that. Yeah. For the prototypical thinker and the systemic thinker, the diversity of the reality is what exists. And the abstract typology is just a limitation, a reduction of this reality. So the uh, Pagliasa reconstituted a prototypical site, in a way, uh, to, in an attempt to read uh, and unfold the material reality of the, of the site itself. And therefore, in, in its specific specificity, not mm. to become a generic case study of, of other elements. It's very, very important that it's 
uh, seen as very mm. specific to the conditions that, that are there. Out of interest, um, how many people in the audience know the Peninsula site? If you could just put your hand mm. up. Mm. Oh, some. That's yeah. quite a few. <laughs> Or maybe after, say, the next couple of days, you will know it, uh, if not physically uh, experienced face-to-face, -face, but through the exhibition. Well, there is an uh, event organized by the Minnale. And there's an the event weekend. where yeah, you take... Yeah, orienteering event. What I date think. is it on? I think it was on Saturday. On Saturday. Yeah. Oh, very I soon. think one of the things that is really interesting about um, this... Uh, uh, Biennale and uh, the curation that Claudia did in this conference is that we know that in what was so called bio art and bio design there's a there's a very large group of people in the art field and in, in the product design field that are experimenting with scientists for quite a long time mm. and the architecture field has been sort of slightly alien to it for a bit too long and we are a rel relatively small group of people who have been sort of contributing in a much more public engagement manner with installations, you know, looking at the architectural and the city scale. And what we are realizing is that the architects have a massive contribution to make to this, to this movement. And this is the understanding that this dysfunctional relationship between nature or the idea of the man-made doesn't make sense, has been proclaimed for a long time, that doesn't make sense, but mm. it needs to be rethought. Mm. And architects were sort of, and surely in schools of architecture, prisoners to this idea that everything has to be made sustainable for the sake of sustainability. But in fact, nothing really changed. The design that has integrated sustainable systems continues being based on modernist sort of principles. And I think what is interesting about this and the contribution that architects are also giving to this is actually that computation is playing a very key role because a lot of the bio art and bio design that has been published and exhibited was to a large extent non-computational. Mm. It was very lab-based, experimental, interesting, installational, but lacked a different dimension that is also more spatial that we, can, we are starting to make as a contribution. And that's why sort of I think we should not forget that there is a broader sort of movement that is happening and we are sort of stepping into this now as a larger group and that's why sort of it, it just makes complete sense that this biennale is happening yeah. and having this focus. Are you saying that also some of the avant-garde experimental ideas of the late 60s, early 70s, where they were living with the technologies of the day that were limited, are today now with computation we can re we can pick up on sure. some of the... Surely impulses. there's some of that, mm. but I think there is something also entirely new happening. And there is actually a really new synthesis between the biological and the computational and mm. the spatial and environmental that is just to be discovered. And mm. it's actually where we all sort of are contributing in small bits to this new scenario. Yeah. You know, yes, some of it goes back to what in the 60s and 70s was already sort of envisioned, but others is not. Others is actually an entirely new remit. Mm. Right. Mm. And that's what is, I think, making also a lot of scientists, product designers or artists, interested in what the architects are now starting to make. Mm -hmm. right? Something that I found uh, quite interesting in these days here working, which uh, somehow just occurred to me, you know, in, in the process, it wasn't necessarily so pre-staged by, by Claudia or by, or by us as such. It, it was that, you know, in the end of the day, especially the ground floor of the, of the, of the exhibition, it's, uh, it's very much about drawing, uh, really. So in a way, you could think of it as, as a quite traditional <laughs> exhibition, despite being, yeah. you know, loaded with, with, with you know, the devices, machines, biology, etc. But, of course, so, so I guess that's the, 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 the common uh, theme is that it is, it is really the computation, this kind of level in which uh, uh, these drawings are, are, are understood. And, and at the same time, um, computation really finds uh, many different ways to express itself, you know, through little robots, through digital agents, mm. through, uh, you know, laser cutting, through, uh, um, uh, you know, slime molds and so on. And, 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 well, and all of these drawing are... And drawing is sensing, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Whether you, and, and you use a pen or uh, you're using a sort of sensors and act actuators. There are at least a uh, six different ways in which uh, uh, you know this sort of uh, drawings uh, occur in the exhibition and 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 in and none of them is a traditional way of drawing but they are all drawing in a way and and I think that's it's what I meant also before by by kind of shifting the the, the problematic fields it's really about kind of 
through drawing, depicting the city, the contemporary city, from a completely different perspective. And, and that, I think, really enables a much more profound, uh, potentially, a much more profound way of, uh, of, uh, of engaging with, with it. And, and therefore, all the other uh, uh, great experiments that, that we are doing with, with living organisms and, and, and all of these kind of systems, you know, find uh, a, new, a new perspective and also a, a new mean of actualization, if you want. No? Of course. I think this is a good point to open it up to get a few quick comments. Great to hear some some, some questions, challenging or otherwise. Does anyone have any questions? There are also some exhibitors in Anthropocene Island in the audience who may need to, may want to challenge their curator. I'll give you a few minutes. No questions. Not yet. Complaints. Complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Is Veronica still here? I guess we need to continue on our side then. Okay, well, uh, maybe I can, um, while you're thinking of your question, maybe, maybe I'll turn back to Marcos and ask, because um, you both, uh, with, you, with Claudia and Marco for some years, colleagues at the Bartlett, um, how do you uh, compare, what do you see that the correspondences and the singularities between um, their approach and your, your own? And they, obviously they're very complementary, uh, but this notion of bio-integrated design is something that they themselves, as you mentioned, uh, you're admiring of the, the multi-scalar ability. I, th I think basically we feel part of a family of thought where yeah. We're sort of opportunistically finding projects and ideas and developing it further because there's a sort of contribution to a new scene. Mm. Um, and I think there's a complementarity because every single pavilion, every single project actually opens up a set of new questions which are really interesting for the other ones to use. And do you so have as many co congresses and co symposia as Bart with so exacting with his uh, Montenegro project where you had three symposia? Are you, do you enjoy opening out these questions for a public audience? Sure, obvi Is that obviously. that that happens? I think for the, the bio-integrated design idea there is clearly a complementarity also in the field of nature-inspired engineering. Mm. And that is, there is a bigger um, and, and, and growing field of exploration that comes from now from a long time ago, from the biomimetics, etc., where nature-inspired engineering is gaining weight. And there's a lot of uh, synergy uh, where we, with the design and the biointegration, are starting to contribute to what they are contributing to us. Mm. Um, I see there's a real interesting parallel. And then there is a lot of sort of the other side, which is, again, bringing that in overlapping in certain areas, is when you go out into the public and you, you have sort of much more of a critique and a provocation attitude in the public realm, where you get sort of, you shift the mindset of people. And I think both Mitchell's presentation, you know, Ecologic Studio, I think some of our installations do that naturally. And that is they, they really provoke the society to think differently of where we are mm -hmm. positioned mm -hmm. and where design really plays an important role um, with unpredictable solutions, without a positivist sort of mindset that we are finding the new path. Mm. I, th I think it's not actually about that uh, because, in fact, quite a few things that we are doing, we know are, are implying huge risks as well at the mm. same time. Mm. So, uh, but we know that the status quo of sort of keeping with the modernist legacy and then adding a few sort of new technologies doesn't, doesn't do it. Um, so I, I think there is, there's actually a complementarity and, a, and an yeah, excitement of seeing these differences. But I think, uh, I, I often wonder, and I don't have an answer for that, but I often wonder whether we can find a different way of defining practice and research and done by specifically individual or groups because I think this category like biocomputation, biotechnology, computation, discrete, continuous, uh, critical, acritical, this category flatten a little bit the diversity, which is much more articulated and complex and rich. So I think each group 
could be almost defined by an algorithm mm -hmm. <laughs> that defines how taps into multiple disciplines <laughs> without uh, trying to fit a group into a precise disciplinary boundary that at the end of the day, um, I think in terms of language, tend to flatten a little bit what the group can um, contribute to the discourse. So, of course, we need to define things because we cannot be uh, mute. <laughs> if we don't sure. define things, we are sure. mute. But which kind of language can we evolve in order to be ma less typologist and so look less at abstract uh, category, but much more at this material difference that we are also are not yeah. only not only the bacterial material difference, but we are also material difference in terms of professional and researcher, and we are a mix of these elements. So I think yeah. it's important, and what the Biennale is also trying to do is to evolve a language which is much more specific in these mm -hmm. terms and this intersection between interest. Yeah. That no, defines what we do. Oh, there's also, gone. Uh, I was going to ask him what he's talking about. <laughs> 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 but I think there are also oh, profound, uh, profound differences in a way between uh, what Marcus and you are doing. Because, of course, there is uh, this idea of, of a family. But let's say there's also, when I compare the work of Mitchell and your work, uh, you work on components, on parts. Uh, and those are confronted with society in a very different way than, let's say, the urbanistic and planning work that Ecological mm -hmm. Studio is involved in that, that interests me. Uh, you're confronting society when it is about norms, uh, patents, uh, uh, bureaucracies, etc. And the work, and also in this Biennale or the work that I've been involved in, uh, confronts uh, a city uh, with, uh, and as a dem democratic body with uh, proposals for the planning of that city. And uh, that means that the provocations that we all produce in certain ways work different and ha also have a different function, I think. Uh, provocations are, are, are important. Uh, they're not the only tool we, we have, I, I would say, particularly when you go to such a democratic process. Eh? We've seen that Mitchell uh, keeps uh, certain images he doesn't show us because they still have to be patented, for example. So that means you can't uh, uh, provoke with everything. There are also things that you have to keep secret. Uh, for example. Sure. So, provocation is uh, just one strategy, and of course, uh, because most of us work, uh, let's say, as a kind of in a kind of contemporary avant-garde, we are also sometimes, it's sometimes easy of ourselves to say that our uh, provocations are, are productive, and I leave it at that, but there is, of course, a much broader kind of set of instruments that you can use to, uh, to make your... Uh, your work and your ideas work in society. Mm. And uh, I think that is really important. So it's also important, I think, to stress the differences. Also in terms of, let's say, working in a more Anglo-Saxon or American environment, uh, I find it really in interesting how Mitchell is uh, Mitchell's relationship with the practice as opposed to the acad academic work that is uh, often uh, dominating uh, in our field uh, in, uh, here. Uh, and I think that that produces something. I'm also sure that to say here in Tallinn there will be in the press uh, re reactions to the proposals here. And that is a very different uh, confrontation uh, uh, with, uh, with the reality, with society, than when you're working in, uh, in the academic field, I think, or in an artistic field. Uh, and that is, is very important. Uh, there is a circuit of academia, there is a circuit also of biennales all over the world, uh, in which you can, but it is also important every time to try to get out of that. If that is a provocation, uh, maybe they embrace the work here in Tallinn, who knows? Huh? Mm. But uh, there are different ways of, uh, of dealing with mm. I wanted to ask Mitchell what he thought of Claudia's point about distinctness and, uh, and how you're, in relation to your broadening of the instruments that you use and awareness within your wider field of operation of your bioengineering. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I really hate agreeing with everyone on a panel because I, I often like a little bit of tension and of course some provocation. But uh, I, I think at this point it would be about nuances. Claudia brought up a very good point. Uh, and certainly actually maybe Bart said it best, um, I guess uh, t two points ago where he brought up uh, Tim Morton 
and defining ecology versus nature. Because we've been sitting around talking about uh, computational biology or integrated biology or material studies or urbanism and, and landscape and all these are relevant. But the, the, Tim Morton's uh, philosophy has been fantastic in, in ways of couching and almost taxonometrically speciating all these issues to something that becomes uh, almost the, the undergridding dialogue of, of what we're talking about. I mean, the, the key point that we don't use the word nature or, or that we realize that nature has probably 20 different definitions. You ask, any, you ask 10 scientists what nature means, you're going to get 10 different answers. Uh, let's stick to ecology. It's very precise. It has known quantifiable systems. It has ways of engaging the landscape. It has ways of studying flora and fauna. And then there's points where you can build and argue on those things. Well, when, when you guys were also discussing computation, I think actually there's many layers to computation. There's no one definition. We all know this. I, I, I know that's real. But I think there's a big difference between Greg Lynn's work and Greg Lynn is fantastic. He's a superhero. But Greg Lynn, when he was taking on this early work about biology and architecture, it was just image. It was using computation to create the look. It was style. And it was no different than modernism in the past, just with a, a new look. Uh, obviously, he's gone on to change that. But the work of everyone on this panel, I mean, we are actually engaged with real materials. You cannot just do a model of E. coli in, a in some piece of software and expect you're going to understand its behavior. You're going to actually have to work directly with E. coli or algae or what have you. So that changes the game. I, I don't think we can also fully define ourselves yet. Let's leave that up to our grad students when we're old or dead. They'll define what it is that we did, and, and that'll be okay with all of us. I, I think that uh, I, I'm okay. And I also want to be, you know, it's really important to recognize the, the, the scales of time in the operations that we're working with. When we do something, uh, for instance, in, in telecommunications or small scale product design, a mouse, I don't know, that's five years from a napkin sketch to something that no people don't even consider prototypes on Claudia's point, but actually you can purchase someplace. You can really create a, a serious paradigm shift in about five to seven years at the product scale. Uh, it, at the scale of transportation, automobiles, freight delivery systems, that's a 15 to 20 year argument. You, even if you have a working electric car, it takes 15 to 20 years before someone could buy one in Europe or the United States. It needs to, it's a much longer uh, scale of engagement and a different scale of economy. Uh, architecture is a 40 year platform. I mean, people don't, you can certainly create these paradigm shifts in heroic feats of individual buildings or building elements, absolutely. But before everyone adopts them, it takes about 40 years because boiler heaters, windows, roofs, people don't want to replace their boiler, boiler heater till it breaks. So you're not going to get in this new thought of, uh, you know, algae on the facade for biomass production to happen anytime soon, but we do need the arguments. And cities... I guess is my final point, that's a hundred year plus argument where all these different things are engaged and integrated and argued until you finally see a shift in city design. You can have Brasilia, you can have Mazdar or Chandigarh. Sure, you can have these one-off totalizing new conditions for cities, but not. we won't see a real new pattern for a hundred plus years. So the arguments that we're having now, there's a there, this is for the, the history books, it's for pedagogy, at least that's my tip. <laughs> but uh, uh, Mitchell, that uh, interests me because you started your presentation with the growth of the world's population. And this growth of the world's population also uh, makes cities growing faster and faster. Uh, yeah. So how do you see, how does, let's say, this demand to accommodate all these people, both in, in housing or in food or whatever it is, and these uh, speeds of development, how can we uh, reconcile uh, these different speeds with each, with each other? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, the, the, the fact is we need a crisis. We won't get to all of these, a library, a library of ideas that we have achieved in visioning new cities, and that's the work of everyone here, 
just not going to happen overnight until there is a, a serious reason. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a great moment in American history. That is when our idiotic Congress, these, the, you know, the government class, decided to agree that there was a common enemy and retool the United States to re rethink its industry, its patterns of production, to fight the enemy. And that, that took only just a, a few days after Pearl Harbor. A nice crisis allows us to engage the, ne the next bit uh, of intervention that has to occur. And I, I don't want a crisis, uh, but, but I, I, we've been talking about this since the 50s. Our professors have been engaged in the issues of climate dynamics and the impact of resource extraction. It is, it, we're, we're the third generation of this argument. My students are almost bored. So I do think that more Hurricane Sandys, more Hurricane Irma's, uh, perhaps a good volcano or two, and directly linking them to the science behind it and somehow getting rid of the deniers. By the way, I apologize for Donald Trump. I, I am so sorry that happened. But I don't know with this culture of, of 50 million people in the United States that don't think climate change is real. I, whatever we say in this panel is not going to make a difference. So it's the scales of time, and it, I think a, a nice crisis will, will sort of uh, help us re-engage that. Unless someone else has a better idea. The, the dark ecology movement, which is Tim Morton and, and, and Paul Kingsnorth and others, they've given up. They've decided we've been telling everyone these are some things we need to do and fit with in you know, the lines and the language of business. But folks are just really interested in something called predatory delay. Every single day, an oil company is in business. Their profits are enormous. So they'd be very interested in saying yes to us. Let's do an algae building. Yeah, Let's work with solar. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. The climate change exists or doesn't exist, the change exists or doesn't, is also that it's not visualized and, and is not present, is not tangible. The way it's discussed is accessible only to scientists. And so we need to trust a magazine or a scientist to know whether climate change exists or not. So. That I think is problematic, and that's why I put algae into building, not, not to save the world, but to try and uh, communicate this yeah. relationship between patterns and behavior and uh, the actual social context. So only in that way, I, I believe you can uh, change or make a change, because the problem is that uh, these type of issues are uh, treated in a very... Um, sort of uh, climate change is almost a product and an accessible box. What if we draw climate change? Uh, we were discussing actually with Marco about uh, my forthcoming Innsbruck professorship about glacier that shrinks. Glacier shrinks, oh, a disaster. Is it a disaster? Is this good? Is this bad? How do we know? Can we draw it? Can we draw it and materially experience what is happening. And once we experience it, then maybe we get a different opinion and we say whether it's good or it's not good. Uh, it's, it's, there is no point of trusting just science calculation for a number that comes out and say that we are in a tragic condition or not tragic condition. We are in a condition. Let's visualize it, let's see it and interact with it. And then we see well, what, what happens. What about Hollywood? I couldn't hear you. Hollywood. Hollywood. Ho ho Hollywood, all those <laughs> movies where the world ends, they're visualizing it. Well, I said more materially, <laughs> less uh, fictionally. I, th I, th I mean, I have a slightly different more position, true. which is that I, I think they are, um, you know, we all are looking for a different set of solutions to one, to some extent, okay? I personally, for instance, I really don't like the word sustainability because it sort of blocks my creativity and I think it blocked the creativity of lots of people. So we are sort of finding other types of solutions. On the other hand, I think we shouldn't lie that we all find actually biological phenomena extremely beautiful. We find them fascinating and therefore we like cyanobacteria and we like invasive visual stuff because it just stimulates our creativity again. It's, giving, it's opening new doors. I mean, let's not fake it, it's the reality. And therefore, we are using computational tools and other tools in order to sort of play with that and at the same time sort of look at, hey, this is actually giving us a different option to 
gain new energy or produce a new carbon absorption system, but at the same time you're creating a different language and playing with something that is opening sort of doors to a different set of uh, possibilities that we find extremely pleasing and exciting. Mm. So I think there is a, a uh, and I agree with Claudia, that it's sort of dangerous to box people into sort of uh, uh, mindsets or approaches or, or styles, or, or because there is currently a sort of merger of different attitudes that we are having in the different projects, um, and, and the timelines are really complex because some of the ideas are quick ideas, but the realizations of some of them takes a long but time, they, but uh, that's, that's... I mean, uh, yeah, that, but that for is, example, is, in this really term, what is the um, aesthetic quality of a glacier that melts? The same of what is the aesthetic quality, and the, can the, this be the language through which we discuss climate change, rather than the language of we are in a catastrophic moment? That's what I'm sure. saying. I, I was actually saying yeah. Look, the same I, I thing. Mean, for, I, I, I grew up, uh, I, I should, I, I, most of you know I'm Dutch, because I even wrote a book about it. But, uh, so uh, so I, I, sp I spent my, as, as a kid, I spent my summers on vacation with my uncle, who was the planter of the polders. And what did he do? Uh, the thing he wanted to do is make these forests look like cubes, because the, the most important designer of the polders was Van Eastern, who was a member of the style. So the village where he lived, uh, Dronten, you could until recently see these square, cubical forests. Now, how did he do that? He would plant different kind of trees, let them stand in the wind, because they react differently to wind, so that he could uh, realize these, these forests. What he would do on vacation, he was photographing all the time. That's the reason I'm, I'm still photographing, because I was fascinated. And he photographed wherever he went, all the individual flowers and plants, and he would produce completely artificial ecology. So when a couple of years ago, Adrian Geuze wants, wanted to plant uh, 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 birch trees at Schiphol Airport, because birds don't settle on them, and birds are bad for airplanes, as we know. So uh, he went to my uncle, who was very old then, and he asked what he would have to do, because he would have to build up an ecology with clover and bees and whatever, and how he would do that. And then at a certain point, he asked my, my uncle, but can we do this? Uh, I mean, is this allowed? Can we do this in the, uh, these kind of ecologies in the context <coughs> of this this area? And my, my uncle said, Adrian, look, there were fish there before. You can do anything. So the idea, it is really intriguing what you say that you today you want your architecture or your designs that you like them to be organic because you like nature. Because it was very recently in my youth that people would try to make nature look like a machine. So that is an inter interesting question. Uh, because does that mean that we suddenly like nature more and want to mimic it because it becomes rarer, because it is in a crisis? Or what is really the reason that we want it to look like nature? Because we like I, it. I didn't use the word deal. nature, no, actually. No. I used the yeah. word biology, and then I used the word invasive. And actually, I think there's partly a stimulus that we are getting from looking in this invasive manner. Uh, you know, we are not looking at the Darwin scale of things. We are looking actually into a, a completely, entirely different scale that biologists are working with and in biotechnology, where we know that bottom-up there are processes that have massive impact on the larger scale. And they are partly learning systems. That's why you know, slime molds are interesting to observe, because they have certain behaviors that we then take them to a different scale and, and, and give us different clues of how behavior works. But at the same time, we're looking also at the opportunity that on such scale, materials might bind together through mycelium or through something else that in fact, again, extrapolating it onto another scale might create different solutions. So the, the, bio, the nature that you're talking about has a different scale. I think we are clearly obsessed currently in looking at a much smaller scale and this invasive scale and actually what we don't see with our eyes. We need microscopes and other sort of instrumentation. And we are fascinated with the growth cellular principles that are happening on this bottom-up level. Um, so it's, it's not exactly a comparable story, but uh, what I'm basically m making as a case is it, this is not about you know, we are finding new solutions, we are believing you're not the scientists. I think there's a, there's a level of critical attitude we should continue having that sometimes we are being very opportunistic 
Um, and sometimes we are being actually quite consciously trying to work towards a goal of finding a new solution for something that is pretty func a functional solution. And it's, it's a co combination of these things that it makes it fascinating. Mm -hmm. but that that biolo the biology of, 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 of natural species has an endless amount of intelligence and principles and systems that we can learn from, you can use, I think that's unquestionable, we all know that. It's but, uh, how we do it. And, uh, for me, one of the key points, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying, it, it's that like the, the, the debates around like you know sustainability, climate change, etc. They have the tendency to become ideological, right? I mean, they, they, the way they're presented, they, they always uh, you know kind of push people in you know either one position or the other, right? And and I think to a certain extent, I think one of the contribution that I feel uh, architects and designers can can give, and this is going back to the idea of of representation. It's, it's, it's really to, to, to create a medium where we can sort of operate outside the sort of, you know, strictly ideological opposition. So all of a sudden, you know, we can begin to, to discuss, debate, interact around a topic, let's say, like climate change, for instance, uh, without having to be, you know, uh, ideologically positioned in one position or another. Uh, it's, it, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, the, the question whether, uh, you know, the, we are in a, uh, we are doomed or, or whether on the other end there is no problem at all, it's, it's, it becomes kind of uh, irrelevant, it's, it's a non-question. Like, the question mm. is like, okay, think about a melting glacier and think about, uh, uh, you know, what is actually happening there. If you can begin to describe what is actually happening there, the whole idea of, the, you know, the glacier being made of strata-like trees, you know, the layer each year is one layer, you, got, you have memory of uh, the climate of, of, of you know, uh, thousands of years captured inside of the glacier. There's so much information actually stored that is, So there are so many ways you can look at that body, you know, of ice, and, and I think I think the possibility to begin to depict and access these layers, these interpretations that, you know, basically transform the, this, this kind of body into, into an instrument of knowledge, I think that's what, you know, can really shift the conversation from whether melting gla glacier is, a, is an image that we should portray to, to promote, uh, uh, you know, this vision that we are doomed and so therefore we have to move and do something, or whether that's just a kind of natural occurrence which is fine, it's just a little bit accelerated, you know? Don't you think, Marco, that, I mean, particularly the tragic events in the last couple of weeks, uh, the whole of this year, you know, there's deforestation, all the fires, uh, the, the hurricanes and so on, these are revealing the total inadequacy of the models that already exist, so totally inadequate building techniques, totally inadequate land use techniques that you cannot I know the knee-jerk reaction typically in crises is the, uh, the, the government comes in and builds uh, sort of army-style barracks for emergency housing. So it's almost like what is normal is that the, the, the emergency services are obviously a lot of tents, but temporary, but they take a step back. That's yeah. their knee-jerk reaction, yeah. whereas in fact, what has been revealed has been totally inadequate yeah. provisioning in the, in the first place. That to get out of that vicious cycle, um, which obviously is ex exacerbating social inequality, mm -hmm. as it generally affects the poorest members of society, no, I, that you, you, you um, I think that being your work can come <laughs> in and absolutely take a, no, I mean, everyone I, in, within this group could come in and take a, a, a huge, um, paradigm shift, shift, jump forward, come up with something different. You need to answer, I quick, agree or I don't answer. agree? <laughs> I think we will have to uh, no, call I mean, to I, a halt I, in I, 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 I totally yeah. agree with that, but like, let's say, it may sound a little bit of a detached perspective, but mm. you know, there, is, there is obviously a, a kind of fascination in looking at a hurricane as a natural process and the fact that it, you know, it's actually fascinating in itself, and then there is the kind of destruction that it can make on, on you know, sort of man-made settlements and, and the idea of, you know, what can we do about it, right? But at the same time, you can also look at the hurricane in itself and describe, in, in trying to, to, to know about it and study it and in order to understand, uh, you know, what, how can you deal with it, mm. you know, th th that becomes also a way to, to uh, again, like, go across the scales, across regimes and really understanding a, a, a kind of having a much broader and deeper perspective on what on one side causes this and on the other side how that impacts. So I think for yeah. me, 
the, the, the hurricane itself is fascinating, but it's not so much about uh, you know studying it for the sake of, of you know of understanding nature. For me, it's really uh, I understand the hurricane as a kind of a, uh, you know uh, artificial elements in a way that like we know it through our tools through our computational tools is provoked by us no mm. doubt about it mm. it's having an impact on us so the frame we should look at the hurricane is not the frame of nature as we traditionally understand it but it should become a tool to understand how we can transform uh, uh, you know our cities and and so therefore for me is a tool of uh, is, is part of the framework of architecture sure yeah i think at this point it would be great to to know whether anyone has a a very burning question. Otherwise, uh, we, we will be here informally <laughs> after we get off the stage, and you can ask us on a one-to-one -one basis. And uh, I think are we all going to be around in the next day for the day two of this uh, symposium? So feel free to ask us any question uh, tomorrow as well, because it's been quite an amazing day, and there's a lot to a lot of very intriguing and uh, thought-provoking uh, conceptual and methodological revelations. So I think there's a lot to unpack. Um, so it remains. I don't see any hands, but I'm, maybe we will have some more hands tomorrow. It's, uh, it's not essential. Oh, yes. I, I, saw oh, I saw hands that ah, we have one hand. <laughs> okay. make a sign that I should kill you. So, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah. Right? So yeah. I think we, we should stop. stop. We are asked no, to stop already but for a while. Well, let's get the question now. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> it's right. the microphone. Are we not in a hurry? Are we? I don't know. No. Is it? Are we in a hurry? Not yet. We should finish in right, the okay. next few minutes. Ten minutes. Are they kicking us out? Or no, no. no there no. is the op other. Op <laughs> there is the op <laughs> It's actually not a question. It's just another statement of okay. of, of someone who studied biology in my past, and I, I still remember and and. Re and commenting on, on the convers little conversation between Bart and, and Marcos. And I remember uh, I studied in the 70s biology, and there I was mesmerized by anything by a molecular level that at that time was already studied. So, for example, if we eat uh, hummus, you know, we, could, we knew already what's going on in the body and how the chickpeas are being uh, absorbed and what happened and what kind of. Uh, a cycle of uh, molecular um, chemistry happened there. Uh, same with so it's about biochemistry, bio, uh, microbiology, and, and so on. Where in in, in um, botany it was still very primitive kind of uh, approach, where we we went out in the field and look at flowers and count petals, and it seems so boring, uh, though it might be kind of beautiful. And and uh, I think it took maybe. 80 years or longer for the molecular, you know, research on molecular level to kind of in, intrigue and arrive actually into architecture. And I think it's fascinating. And it, it's always there's time for certain things. And somebody wiser than me, and a long time ago, I, I, I saw it said that the end of the 20th century was preoccupied with the digital. And 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 uh, and the 21st century is all about molecular level, and I think architecture, at least the, the conference here, is, is related to that, and that's how I kind of agree with what Marcos said that uh, the you know if you're intrigued by something contemporary and new, and you know we kind of arrive there, and it's yeah. kind of, it's really great, and just I just felt no. I'll add that. Thank you. Thanks. Shall we close here? Okay, so um, with that final thought, I think we'll draw things to a close. So it remains for me to thank everybody on the stage very warmly for your great contributions, Claudia's great cultural leadership for the whole Biennale. We are excited to see everything. And um, to everybody in the audience for being such a great, attentive audience. Thank and you very much. And we hope to see you in... Half an hour, I think, that the opening of the uh, installation competition and the curator exhibition and the Museum of Architecture. And then tomorrow here for the symposium. Thanks. And thank you to Mark Mitchell.